public works, so about 19%. It's only $68 million to run your departments. Probably a lot less than most people think, at least in the conversations that we've had. And from some of our comparisons, pretty much in line. Some, con some concerns were pretty much in line. Of this $68 million to run your departments, only $28 million is salary. So of your $130 million budget, only $28 million is salary. This is a very important upfront analysis because one of the tools typically that we go into a toolbox with is we begin to look to cut expenses. The, generally the first expense you might look to cut is salary. But you're spending only $28 million. When I say only $28 million, it's still significant. And I want to put some context around that, but $28 million is salary. So in total, this departmental spend accounts for 53% of the city's budget. So what does the 2014 budget really say about itself? Police, as you can see, represent 32% of the budget. Fire, 31%. Other departments, 37%. Salary is 59%, $28 million. Other expenditures, $40 million. So that it, this means it costs $68 million to pay for the services that your citizens would expect to have police, fire, garbage pickup, and the running of the internal offices. But what about the 40 million of the 68 million that's not salary? Because remember I said we're about a, a 30, we're about a, uh, we're, we're, we're a budget that's 130 million, but 48 of that 68, because only 28 salary, so 40 is not salary. What's that 40? And what about the remaining 60? We took the 60 and the 68, we got pretty close with the rounding to the 130 million. So what's that 40? So let's go take a look at that. Let's look at the police department, for example. The police department has 11 million in salary. Its equipment, education, travel is 760,000. And there's another $11 million. What's that other $11 million? It's, uh, it's your benefits, pension and benefit. And as you will see tonight, almost all roads lead to the pension problem. So our solution ultimately has to be one that solves the pension problem. If we reverse engineer from the pension problem, it really, it really fixes the budget. Now, it's a little bit hard to see because we have a blue line, but you'll see the blue line represents your salary increases from 2008 through 2014. Why is that blue line relevant? We want to really see what your salaries went up over the past few years and see if those were a natural flow, if they flowed consistent with uh, your contracts and your staffing. Because around 2008 is when uh, your serious economic and financial crisis began. But look at what happens with health care and pension, the red line. It's a very dangerous curve, and it's about to, it's about to go become more expensive, your benefits are about to become more expensive than your salary line. So that health care piece and that pension piece become really important points of examination for us because we have to figure out a way to straighten that line out some. So the leftover $60 million is what we call non-departmental spending. So I've accounted just for you right now. I've accounted for salaries. I've accounted for pension. I've accounted uh, for benefits. You have $15 million in debt service, which excludes the uh, service of the $17 million TAN. Um, you only had to take about $12.5 million in TAN. It's an expensive credit right now because the city's credit's in a difficult spot. Um, but the good news is you're on target to pay that back in July, and that might be the e earliest it's ever been paid back, showing better cash management. So when we took a look at your 2014 budget, the very first thing we wanted to be certain about, is there any disruption in 2014 that needs adjustment? Is there anything about the 2014 budget that's not going to hold, that's going to create a surprise for us? Is there a cash crisis? Because there's budgets and there's cash. We all live in homes and families. We make annual budgets, but the reality is the expenses generally are more than the revenue, and that's cash. And we have to watch cash in Scranton. So you only needed 12 million of a projected 17 million for a TAN. So the amount of interest rate that'll be paid back, even though it's a high rate, is less than what might have been uh, called for. 
Then you have a $22 million one-time court award and $7 million for outstanding prior obligations. So we're rolling over $7 million from 2013 into 2014. So we're actually starting with a $7 million headache from last year. Now, the $7 million coming from last year is unusual. The $22 million is very unusual. The debt service is typical, although your debt service is a little high given what it was used for, and I'll explain that in a few minutes. And the use of a TAN is a typical cash flow tool for municipalities, but you really want to get your credit uh, in shape, so you're borrowing your TAN, your line of credit, your short-term cash. You want to borrow it at the cheapest rate you can and get it repaid as quickly as you can. These are all things that the credit agencies take a look at. So when you take out the extraordinary expenses and the TAN, Scranton's really only making an appropriation of $84 million. The 68 I talked about to run the city, plus the debt service. So you're really an $84, $85 million budget. Forget the difference for now. Let's park it in the corner. Forget the difference for now between the 84 and the 130. You've got an $84, $85 million appropriation. That's our zone. That's your expense. Now, you're generating about $82 million in revenues. So as we began this analysis, we even started with the expectation that the delta between appropriation and revenue was going to be greater and that there was going to be a harder bridge to build to get those to meet. We ideally like to get cities into a place where after two or three or four years, they can actually begin to build surplus. The credit agencies generally like to look at 3% of your total operating budget, in your case, somewhere around 85 million, 3%. If you can ever build to that surplus, it'll be really terrific news, reestablish your credit and do exactly what budgets are supposed to do, be a very boring thing on an annual basis. So the city is really pretty close to structural balance, and that happened in large part because of the tax uh, increase. And I'll get back to tax increases uh, in, in a few minutes. So your non-extraordinary appropriations, health care, pensions, salaries, debt service, and other expenditures, your revenue break down to real three categories, real estate taxes, local taxes, and a group of other that I'll explain to you in a few moments. Now let's just take a look at this left chart for a moment. Healthcare, we know it's growing rapidly, relatively fixed, hard to bend. But we think there are some opportunities, even without significant contract modification, to reduce your healthcare spend through utilization management. Pensions, fixed. The city's pension obligation is significant, and by 2016 will grow to really significant, and that is where your greatest threat comes from your increased pension obligation. If you are not actually the most distressed pension in the state, you're second. In 2011 actuarials, it was the most distressed pension. Salaries, as I said before, whenever we try to come in to fix a business, we try to attack salaries, if, if at all possible. But because of your economic condition, you've already had quite a bit of compression, and you are at some minimum staffing ratios, particularly in a complicated geographic uh, environment, uh, with your 26 square miles. So salaries become hard to attack. Um, they become hard to fix in the short term. In the long term, you might want to harvest attrition. You'll negotiate new contracts. And as you'll hear from me in a little while, you're going to want to control and move some of these dials in that pie. 17% is debt service. So our job, if we can give you a plan and a recommendation that you can actually execute on, is going to be to gr sh shrink that left pie a little bit, reconfigure some of the pie chart so that we have better percentages and grow those revenues by a little bit and then Scranton is just going to be in fine shape. So I've been asked by different people, what's the thing that keeps you awake at most? What's the thing, what, what's the greatest threat you see here? And the greatest threat I see is that today, pensions are 15% of your budget. They're eating too much of the budget. We've got to change that numerator denominator. And we do have some solutions. We, we won't identify a problem without a solution. Next slide, thanks. 
So in, in the language I use in, in dealing with municipal budgets and dealing with distress environments and determining whether an environment is one that can turn around or whether a, a, a bankruptcy plan might be the type of things in place, and I don't think that that's needed here in Scranton. I would tell you otherwise if I did. But in any event, you still have to go through an exhausting examination and make every single attempt to have a restructuring and a workout prior to the state allowing that. And I don't think because, uh, I, I think because you have such, uh, so many solutions in place that you'll get to where you have to be. So much of your budget is marbleized. And what we, use by mar what we mean by marbleization is it's inflexible. It's fixed. It's hard to change. We're not going to be able to chip away at it significantly. For example, if the city went out of business, you still need your entire tax levy. Your taxes wouldn't go down at all because you still have to pay your debt and your, your pension. So you have about 22, 24 million thereabouts coming in. Uh, maybe it's 27? Yeah. Seven? 28 million. So you have 28 million just from your real estate levy, and you have 15 million in taxes, and you're, you're on your way to 13 million, your portion of a pension payment. Just, just your debt and your pension payment eat the entirety of your tax bill, the municipal portion. So what we have to do is look at revenue-based solutions because we don't have a lot of room to bend on the expenses and then fix the expenses such that they hold a constant metric percentage in your budget moving forward. So let's look at the judgment because it's the most immediate problem for a whole host of reasons. The judgment's a current liability deeply unsettling to a lot of people, but from my perspective, credit markets are where you're going to reestablish your strength and manage your debt and manage your future. And these judgments, this kind of judgment, is of great concern to the credit market. So let's, for our purposes, call it what it is. It's debt. It's not, a, even though it's a current liability, we have to convert it from a current liability, because you can't pay it, to some type of payout. And if we simply negotiate the payout with the CBU, whose preliminary meetings have been particularly receptive to working with us on this, we're only going to be able to get a 10-year amortization. If we can convert it to more general debt, and we all dislike converting what essentially was a loan from the employee base into long-term debt, but we are where we are, we can get a 20-year amortization. So we're going to take that $22 million and what we're going to do is just park it in that corner over there for a second. And I'm going to come back to that $22 million and explain to you how I think we're going to incorporate it into a new debt, a new debt stack. So we all borrow, right? We borrow to put new kitchens in our house. We borrow to put rooms in our house. We borrow to pay our children's tuition. But we always view that type of borrowing as an investment that has a return uh, on investment, an ROI of some sort. Scranton, for a while, had pretty good borrowing. And you're going to see that somewhere around uh, 06, 07, things started to change. And clearly, that's when your fiscal crisis began to bake itself in. So you had debt capacity. You had the ability to absorb more debt in your budget. Now, it's good planning to borrow on a capital plan and invest in your infrastructure, invest in your streets, invest in buildings, invest in parks. It's not good to invest in deficit spending. You may get a year at that because you got upended a little bit, but we all know from our own homes, if we continue to take the equity out of our home to pay the expenses on running our house, which is greater than our income, sooner or later we're out of equity in the home and we're upside down. Scranton is in that direction it's borrowed a lot of its equity. So if you look at the aggregate debt, you have $98 million in debt that I call relatively typical, but a good chunk of that are refunding bonds that you did in, in 2012 and some sale leasebacks that you did in 2008. And whenever I see a sale leaseback, you're gonna ask two questions. Did somebody do a sale leaseback to invest capital in the building? 
So if you did a sale lease back to raise money for, it's usually a little bit more expensive, to raise money for putting capital into the building, it's generally tax-free debt, it's generally okay. But if you did a sale lease back because you had to pay for expenses because you didn't have enough revenue, you have a cash crisis, generally that debt becomes taxable. You have pretty good coupons on that debt, but you started to do that in 08, and that tells me that that's where the problem was beginning to take place. Then you have $48 million in debt in your parking authority. The parking authority, you know, is in a literal default on the first tranche of its debt, and we are exploring different options with how to deal with the parking authority. We are looking at bringing the parking authority in and servicing the debt through a combination of parking revenues and meters, and we're also looking at monetizing and selling the parking garages, and it's not a decision we get to make alone because you're at a situation now where the bond insurers, and there's only three really left in the country, all with tre tremendous exposure, one in the bankruptcy reorganization, need to sit at the table and be part of the conversation because they don't want to draw on their insurance account to make a bondholder whole because we didn't do what we should have done or could have done. So with Dave's uh, leadership, we've begun the process now of meeting with the bond insurers to, in, to begin the conversation of how best to solve the parking authority issue. The inclination at this point in time is probably towards a monetization, a sale of the garages, but this is still premature and we still have a whole lot more modeling conversations and discussions and it all centers around what's the real value of the parking garages. It's all going to come down to what does that, what's that piece of real estate really worth. But we're going to treat it as our debt right now, because in reality it is. We're, we're not going to sugarcoat it. We're not going to pretend it's somewhere else. We're going to treat it as our debt, because it really is. So now, let me take that $22 million I parked over there for a second. We have $48 million in parking authority debt, $98 million in general city debt, and we have $22 million judgment over there. So we're starting to get ourselves up into the neighborhood of $170 million in debt that we have to figure out how to address. This is without the pension debt. And this will help underscore for you our concern that we're happy that your appropriation and your revenue are so close, just a few million apart. We're deeply concerned about how we accommodate and treat $170 million in debt going forward, particularly when the credit markets are going to be difficult to, to access. So if you look in 2012, and this, is pulled, this chart is set up for a reason. If you look in 2012, you say, how was it that in 2012 we only paid $2.5 million in debt, and today we're north of $14 million in debt? What happened? Well, the debt, you have to look at 2011. The debt in 2011 was probably seven, seven and a half, seven point eight million dollars. In 2012 is the year you did a refunding. And you took your interest payment and you took out new debt and refunded your debt with new interest payment. In other words, what you did is you took your, part of your second mortgage and refinanced it into your first mortgage. And that reduced your debt obligation that year because you didn't have to pay the cash out, and that's how you dealt with your cash crisis in 2012. So the problem is here. There's no, nothing, no more tools like that. You can't do that stuff again. You've got to confront the reality in front of you today. And the reality in front of you today is you're servicing at $14.5 million on an $86 million, $84 million appropriation the debt service that I've discussed, this does not include the $22 million judgment. So I realize it looks small, um, but I can walk you through some of it. And these, the uh, presentation will be available once uh, we print it out for you council folks to have. But if you look at uh, 2002, 2003, right up to that sewer debt of a million six, that's really normal debt. That's what a city's typical debt picture looks like, a city of this size. That's normal, typical debt, investing in yourself, getting an ROI, putting that new kitchen in, fixing that park. Then you go to federally taxable guaranteed lease revenue bonds. They're taxable, 
because this was sale leasebacks to put money into the budget to deal with your deficits. And that's the signal to me that in 06, 08, you were using sale leasebacks as a means of dealing with some deficit funding. And by the way, you're not alone. You're certainly not alone. There's a whole bunch of cities, as we know, going through this. The double whammy, you can sometimes do this stuff, but at the same time, we see an accelerating pension payment and an accelerating health care payment <coughs> that's really starting to throw you, to, to, to throw the city off. Then we see in 2012, series A, B, and C, that's the refunding bond I just told you about. That's the new borrowing to pay your deficits, and that's how you were able to reduce your payment for debt in 2012. So that's where your 98 million is. Then you have on the next, uh, the next part, your parking authority debt, no 406 and 07. As I said, it's our debt now for a total of 146, 147, plus the 22, and that's where we are. So what are the consequences of bad credit? Access to the credit markets is very difficult. There'll be people who lend to you. There's generally always people who will lend but their rate of lending is based upon their risk. So if the risk is high, the rate of lending is high, but moreover, they have to be confident that there's a plan in place that can be executed because that delevers some of the risk. So the city is paying right now a high price for its TAN because of its economic condition. If the city were to even be able to access the credit market today, if we were able to even refinance this debt or some of this debt, we would pay very high rates. And quite frankly, for your early debt and your refunding bonds, you're paying, you're paying a decent rate, your, your sale leasebacks, you're paying a decent rate. So we, we might want to leave those to defees as, they, as they're scheduled to defees, but we still have to figure out how to restructure the parking authority debt and the $22 million judgment. So what makes creditors worried is the, the parking authority default and the city's pension and benefit obligations. You have $60 million in assets and $173 million in liabilities. You got a $113 million deficit. For all intents and purposes, you are paying as you go because your pension payment is roughly $13 million a year right now with three million or so coming from the state. So you have about five years liquidity, six years liquidity in your pension. This is severely distressed and a horrible funding ratio of 34. And if it's not the worst, it's pretty close. And then we have the immediate crisis of $22 million. So the credit market says to us, the lenders say to us, the bankers say to us, how are you going to handle the parking authority? How are you going to handle the pension? How are you going to handle the $22 million? So let's start talking about solutions. And again, I come with a toolbox. And the toolbox has good tools in it, but not all of them are usable in the environment in which you're in. It's just that plain and simple. It is my early speculation, and I want to caveat this so you understand I haven't had the type of analytical time that I would like to, but I believe firmly that if I were given the time to truly analyze it, a reval would benefit the city of Scranton tremendously. But we, we believe, for a whole host of reasons, that it might not be a utilizable tool right now. But the first thing somebody like me who comes into a town looks to is really what's their assessed value? What are they generating by tax revenue? Are they getting what they're supposed to? And there's a lot of complicating factors, some of which are political. I don't focus on that too much. A lot of complicating factors with revals, but we believe a reval would be a really good tool. But we don't think, at least from our preliminary feedback, it's a likely tool right now. So we need some new sources of revenue. You have a local service tax in place, an Act 205 tax, which is a dedicated pension payment tax already in the state statutes. And then really credit to Dave, who understands debt in, uh, in, a, in a really advanced way. The idea of having been a lender, he knows what lenders think. And lenders like comfort 
and comfort in this business comes from dedicated streams of revenue. So we are currently modeling dedicating some of your real estate tax mill and earmarking a dedicated funding to your pension and putting it through a central payment operation. Now, we haven't modeled this out completely yet. We're at the idea stage, but these are realizable and, and probable, not just potential, probable solutions to bringing comfort to the credit crisis. As I mentioned before, Scranton's parking assets should be responsibly sold off, or if kept inside, we would be dedicating the parking and the meter stream of revenue to servicing that debt. But it's our belief right now, subject to a deeper analysis and more participation with our various colleagues, um, that selling it is probably the responsible, a responsible action and just simply picking up the stranded debt and putting it into that dedicated zone. The unions are part of the solution. If the unions were to force the issue on the judgment, we have a really serious problem and they could precipitate the house of cards coming down. I do want to tell you that the mayor organized a meeting with the CBUs where we discussed their participation and, and potentiality for solutions for the $22 million. And having done this in a lot of places, um, I was really impressed with how responsive they were to work as a unit to help solve that $22 million problem. Good. Right now, Scranton's collecting about 86% of its taxes owed to it annually. I need to take a minute or two to explain this to you because you ultimately actually collect pretty close to what your real uh, tax levy is on an annual basis but you do it through a combination of what's current. You're collecting 86% of what's current, and then in that same year, you're selling delinquent taxes. So you're collecting those delinquent taxes from the prior year. If you can up that collection rate in one year and get it current, it's better for cash. It reduces your reliance on delinquencies. It reduces the risk of delinquencies. But in that subsequent budget, you're not going to be able to budget as much from delinquent tax sales because you've reduced the delinquencies. So best practices like to see collection rates in the mid-90s. Fine fees, permits, licenses, and other city revenues were about $2 million under budget in 2013. What we did is we began to look at your 2013-2012 revenues and how true they were to mark. Were you doing anticipatory budgeting? We think anticipatory budgeting is not a good idea. You don't hopefully budget. You budget generally what you collected last year and maybe never grow at more than 2%. In our business, we call that the revenue cycle. Scranton has a lot in its revenue cycle. You have real estate taxes. You have another category of local taxes. And they have this big category of, of others uh, which deal with things like um, uh, permits, licenses, and, though, and a number of them, jukebox licensing permits, a number of them. We haven't yet spent the time, because our focus has been very much on the debt picture, on determining whether those revenues as budgeted in 2013 are real. We do think in the 2014 budget they are likely to fall a little bit short because we think they were anticipatorily budgeted last year, but Dave has uh, very uh, very adequately addressed covering that on the expense side so we see no harm but we know we can't continue budgeting more than we're getting. At some point we actually have to know what the true yield should be. You can't say you're collecting 80 percent of a tax whose target you've put too high. You got to know what the real targets are supposed to be and that's part of revenue cycle management and that's something we're going to make some recommendations about. We think Again, personal comment here from my own experience, others might disagree. I have, never, I have never experienced a more understaffed administrative office in a, in a BA's office. It's an $86 million P, uh, uh, business with a really small staff running it. It's too stretched, so it's really hard to determine if we're achieving all the revenues. They're working very hard, doing their best, but we think you might want to look 
creatively of how to get a revenue cycle person in, a person whose only job is to make sure all those revenues are being accurately forecasted and hitting their marks. Pilots, um, you know, I never meet with much uh, warmth when I talk about pilots from folks, but pilots are an important part of a city's future in developing a city. Pilots are a tool that economic development folks use to recruit business. Um, by negotiating a pilot, there's all types of statutory requirements around it. That's one type of pilot, payment in lieu of taxes. The second type of pilot is looking at a group of those folks who might traditionally be exempted from taxation and asking them to contribute to the city's future by participating in a voluntary negotiated contract for a pilot. In our next phase, we'll begin meeting with some of those folks. Um, we don't have unrealistic forecasts in our mind on that. Uh, it is again our belief that they are most successful when limited in duration and focused to an area where those putting the money into the pilot believe they're getting a return on investment as opposed to simply putting money into some big bucket. So when we negotiate pilots, we like to find those types of things where the folks paying them know there's a duration, know there's accountability, and know that it's going into a meaningful part of the budget, something that's helping the city. In the case of Scranton, it might be contributing to some of its annual capital expense. Healthcare savings, I mentioned before, I'm going to give you two examples. Everyone thinks when you talk in terms of healthcare savings, uh, the only thing you do is limit the uh, type of coverage, increase co-pays. These are all subject to collective bargaining and probably should be uh, tackled in your next round of negotiations. But there's a genuine, genu a genuine and general movement taking place nationally now to begin looking at utilization. Utilization is the frequency by which you consume health care and how that cons those consumption patterns drive up the cost of reimbursement. So we have, see we have seen different entities working with towns and municipalities to change utilization. And we cite two, uh, for example, Integrity Health and Tom's River. Um, they actually have negative growth in health care because they went in and they put in an employee wellness place in cooperation with a doctor group and area hospitals. The employees pay no copay. They make that their medical home. Much of this happens because of what's happening with the, the Affordable Care Act. And they were actually able to significantly drive down utilization costs, driving down what the actuarial claims the following year might be needed for a premium. We saw this exact same thing happen in Columbia, South Carolina. So we're going to do a deeper dive. We're going to try to work in concert with your CBUs and talk in terms of how we might be able to drive down health care costs, working with them, with wellness at the front, but aligning interest on utilization. Two, three years ago, I would tell you this is more, this is more theory than practice, but we are seeing tremendous gains in practice. It seems that the Affordable Care Act has been able to energize uh, some, some great creative thinking and plus towns can no longer afford 15% annual premium increases. So this is the first 66 days that, we've here, that we're here. This is what we've analyzed. We believe there's a debt solution. We've got to figure out a way to fund with cash the pension. We are working on some models right now and how to dedicate a stream of revenue. There are likely to be recommendations about some new streams of revenue. Our policy always is uh, to as equitably and as, and as, um, as among a wider group as possible distribute that burden. You can't simply always go back to taxpayers. Moreover, we're going to be making a recommendation that the city, as we hope this budget begins to unfold, will consider the obligation, in my opinion, to make sure that you have annual tax increases. Those tax increases need to be small. They need to reflect, to some extent, what cost of living increases are. And it is a more responsible form of management to commit to some year of plan where people understand that the taxes are going to go up by some amount every year. 
but they can't go up in such a way that are confiscatory and at the same time jeopardize uh, people's homes, people's economics. We understand, we measure tax increases in, to the extent that it might be the difference in the 51st week of groceries for somebody, or it might be the difference in making a contribution to a child's uh, education. So we're truly sensitive to it, and we look for policies and opportunities that are broadly dispersed with the, with the least amount of harm done, a very utilitarian approach. Now, moreover, we'll recommend some personnel issues. We'll continue our work with Pell, which we have found to be most helpful, uh, and we hope to be able to submit to uh, the city by the, comp by the duration of this assignment a recovery plan, uh, which will call for a more in-depth ser series of solutions that follow the due diligence on these ideas that we have thus far presented. Uh, with that, uh, members of the council, Mr. Council President, I am happy to answer any questions that you folks might have. Thank you, Mr. Amoroso. Uh, Councilman Rogan? Yes, um, just, a <coughs> excuse me, just a comment and two questions. Um, first, thank you for coming, um, everyone. It's definitely a breath of fresh air to read what was in the paper about the administration and yourself meeting with city bargaining units um, and trying to work out some sort of um, arrangement, which is much different than what we have seen in the past in the city, where those negotiations were made between attorneys in a courtroom. Um, so I think that's definitely a step in the right direction for the city. Um, just two questions. The first one is just a general question. Um, how is Scranton doing, and how is Scranton compared to other cities its size um, around Pennsylvania? All right, so part of our work that we do is we create a metric of what we call a peer group. So the peer group right now has Reading, Allentown, Wilkes-Barre, Erie, Bethlehem, did I miss anybody? That's the peer group we're looking at. We calibrate those peer groups on about 15 or 16 uh, different items. We look in terms of the uh, size of the, uh, of the city. Is it 26 square miles? Is it 19 square miles? We look at geographic makeup. Is it flat? Is it hilly? We look at total population. We look at unemployment rate. We look at average median income. We look at average median household. And by the time we get to the next presentation, uh, we will have that completely laid out for you. And additionally, we also look at what are all their sources of revenue and how do you compare, and what are all their expenses and how do you compare. Our preliminary findings show us that in some areas, you're competitive, in other areas, you're slightly high. And the slightly high probably has to do with some geographic issues. Um, but we, we will have that in a very comprehensive way for you. Great, I'm certainly looking forward to that. And from listening to your presentation, and, and I, it's no secret from being on council for the last four years, everything we read um, about our pension situation. Could you go into a little more detail on exactly how bad our pension <laughs> situation is in the it's city bad. right now? Um, it's bad. It's, so pensions are calculated on the basis of an actuarial formula. And there's not a lot of movement in that actuarial formula. So. What pension actuarials do is they create what they consider to be a long-term predictable rate of return. Uh, my preliminary uh, inquiry indicates that in the case of Scranton, that long-term constant is seven and a half percent. And some pensions I've seen it at eight percent, some I've seen at seven, but the long-term constant is seven and a half percent. That's, that's fair. They generally then also put in a long-term constant on cost of living, inflation. The calculation for inflation has changed in the past several years. Certain items that were in the inflation basket have been taken out, but there are generally accepted economic models of measuring inflation, and we're looking at inflation right now at about 3%. So if you take your 3% and you take your 7.5%, you're making a net gain of 4.5%, and that's what the actuarial looks like. Even though things right now look terrific, that the market is rebounding and you're recovering some, some space, the pension calculation in many places, I'm not sure how it's done in Scranton, is on a, generally on a two-year lag. So you would begin to see some of those benefits bake in now. If you had long-term sustained strong gains, you would see the pension funding formula change to some extent. The third and last element of the actuarial 
is typically the um, life expectancy of the class of folks that you have in, and the actual aerials use a whole bunch in there. So I don't know that there's much movement. There might be some argument around the actuarial assumptions, but not much. So what we have to do is come up with a solution that says we don't want pensions to be 15% of your spend anymore. We want it to be more like 8 or 9%. So now we work with the actuarials to say how much upfront funding is needed today, and then what can we do by way of dedicated revenue to meet our funding obligation, and if we're able to create additional super funding of some sort in that regard, how do we manage to get the pension payment, our obligation, by 2016 into about 8 or 9% of your total spend? We don't know what that plug number is just yet, but we're working on that. And just to follow up on that, and that's very informative. Um, I know there was a few articles in our local papers regarding the pensions and um, the asset allocation with being so heavy heavily invested in bonds. Um, is that something that, that should also be looked at and, and look more towards, uh, towards equities? Well, it's, it's, there's two parts of that question, really. So there's the strategy of how to maximize a return in a distressed pension. And one might think that you chase a higher rate of return as a means of altering that number. The conservative philosophy, one that I probably subscribe to myself, is because you have only five years or six years of liquidity in the pension, safer bets until you can create stability are a, a more responsible course of action, even though it's calling upon you to make larger payments. Certainly that's my thinking. There are clearly people who would differ with me on that and their views would be uh, important and valid. Thank you very much. Mr. Wexler. Thank you. Um, once again, thank you very much for coming, and uh, I'd like to thank you for all the work that everyone's been doing since we got started here. Um, the one question I have is, how does uh, what we're doing here, how is it affected by some of the changes in, uh, that are occurring in, in the state? in terms of the taxes and pensions. Great. Um, we, we had the opportunity to meet with your area senator and reviewed and we've been following and uh, meeting with uh, those parties who are shepherding certain legislation through. So currently the legislature is considering a number of bills, some of which would be potentially very helpful to the city of Scranton. We're happy to encourage uh, and support those bills. We're happy to give uh, our findings and how they might benefit the city of Scranton specifically, um, but we have to be careful to bake them into our planning because they haven't happened yet. And, we, and as tempting as it might be is it's going to pass, it's going to pass, it's going to pass, um, we can't assume that. Uh, I'm a, an alumnus of Villanova. If you had asked me today at uh, 10 o'clock, would Villanova lose to Seton Hall where I'm a professor, I would tell you there's no chance. <laughs> and I would have been wrong. So we want to see the legislation. We're happy to model it, but we don't want to hang our coat on that hook just yet. Okay. But it would be very helpful to Scranton. And in your evaluations, have you touched base with Lackawanna County and the Scranton School District at all? Or? No, we, we'll pro we will probably have little to no interaction with the school district in, this, in, in these six months that we've been allocated, you know, just by time priority. Um, I did uh, exchange um, communications just earlier this week with Lackawanna County as we're beginning the process now of rolling out our conversations and beginning to test some of our assumptions so we could recalibrate them. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lasko? Uh, I too would like to thank you for uh, all your hard work so far. I mean, a little over 60 days. Um, it looks like we're going to have to make some hard decisions down the road, and we will all continue to work together. I just had a, just another question on the pensions. Um, in your working with the pensions and strengthening them, have you looked at the history of how our pension got this way? I mean, I don't believe it's all investments. I believe that there was money taken out from different administrations or not non payments. Well, it's just so we don't repeat that history. It, Clearly, uh, there's been some extent to the latter, not payments. Um, in one year, it may have been 08 or 012, I think. Um, the only payment that went into the pension was the state's portion. 
Uh, so we will, in this next 60 days, take a much deeper look into the history of the pensions and make recommendations as to what we think you should do on a going forward basis. But you just can't take pension holidays. It's, you're, you're, you're just borrowing. And the truth of the matter is, with an aged population and a, and a distribution in your pension system that is closer to retirement, those, those would be really imprudent decisions. Thank you. Uh, that's all I have. Thank Mr. you. Mr. Gowen? Uh, well, I just, <coughs> excuse my voice, I have a cold here. Um, I want to thank you, Mr. Amoroso, for coming in. I thought that was a great presentation. Uh, thank Mayor Courtright, uh, Attorney Shrive, Mr. Bolzoni, and Mr. Weiss. Um, I realize that in three months, that's a lot of work to do, and uh, I really, we all appreciate it. Um, I just want to ask you about, uh, basically about the next steps regarding the remaining items in your contract, um, specifically about three areas. Um, number one, conversations and negotiations with the unions. Number two, the nonprofits. And number three, the sewer authority. Uh, so we know that there was recently a meeting with the unions to present your findings so far. Was that meeting more informational or were you able to begin conversations about the award payment? The meeting uh, was certainly not uh, only some of our findings. It was limited to those things which would deeply affect them. It, th they had not had the benefit of what I presented tonight. Right. Um, it began the process of explaining the difficulties in the budget, and it included, among other things, the need to work on the $22 million judgment, and they clearly expressed a willingness to begin those discussions and how best to achieve that immediately. Okay. So I think uh, that's far along, and now we'll start to get to where the rubber hits the road and negotiate how we may do that. But we also want to do that in a way while we look at, the, you might remember saying earlier, depending upon what we negotiate with them, it may be temporary until we can reestablish our credit and then refund this out so we get the benefit of that 20-year amortization as opposed to a 10-year amortization. We're just not there yet. There's other parts that have to happen. Can you Henry, we met with the unions and with their attorneys on a couple of different occasions, right. me meetings that Henry w weren't involved in, in trying to move forward with, with the arbitration or with the court ruling. Uh, the meeting that we had Monday with, with Henry uh, and all the representatives from the tax office, the clerical union, the DPW union, the police and the fire union. Uh, I, th I think we're more on an informational. And, and some people, uh, if you give me the opportunity to speak on this, some, some people ask, why did we meet with them first? Uh, it was a, just a matter of, of timing. Uh, I did ask Mr. McGough if anybody from council wanted to come and, and no one was available. And then they were, why did you meet with the chamber first? Well, we, Henry was coming up to meet with uh, you people today, so we met with them this morning. Uh, okay. It wasn't that we wanted to meet with anybody before you. That that's just the way it happened. But we've had we've had a couple of meetings with with the unions and and with their attorney, uh, and we're moving forward. And and I'm going to be very optimistic to say I think they're they're very willing to work with us. They know the situation that we're in. Uh, they know we're in dire straits. So I'm 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 confident that we're going to be able to find a solution to it. Good. Thank you. The second piece to your question, we have the pilots. Um, we will begin that now in the next 60 days or the right. second third um, but what we want to do is be able to identify a plan that they will have confidence in um, we just don't think it's a good idea to go and say are you willing right. what we'd rather do is go and say here's what we think you can do to be really helpful mm -hmm. and here's where it'll make a difference and here's how you can measure it and here's how it'll be accountable accountable so we're in the process of putting that together, and we're looking at other peer cities, not just in this immediate area, but pretty much uh, nationally. The third piece on the sewer authority, you know, I think you just asked about the sewer authority. Uh, looking at the sewer authority as a means of monetization, I guess is the question? Uh, <clears throat> well, my question for the, well, if I get, could I back up sure. one second to the non or yeah, to the nonprofits. Um, I guess <clears throat> my, question is what is the strategy over the next three months to address um, contributions for the nonprofits meaning is there um, is there a set number that we're looking at that's going to that, that we want to bring in from the nonprofits that's going to affect the uh, revenue stream 
we, we don't have a specific target yet. We're beginning to model goalposts based upon understanding what the gap is. Okay. What's going to contribute to that gap, that $82, 84 million dollar gap, what's mm -hmm. going to contribute to that gap is debt service. Okay. So if we can look at 2015 and say that in 2015 our TAN debt service is going to come down dramatically because we have better credit and need less, and we're going to be incorporating the parking authority piece in, we'll then know our gap. Right. And we'll also take a look at what some capital needs for the uh, city are that you can't go to the capital market and borrow for because you're going to take care of this parking authority issue and this $22 million judgment. Right. That's giving us our goalpost where we think that they may be able to contribute, but we want to have a plan, and the plan will be prepared, and we will then present to them that plan, I would think, in the next 30 days or so. Okay. Um, so who, who is leading these meetings? Is it, is it you or is it you in the, in the administration? How is that? Yeah. Who, and, like the negotiations of, of those? We always meet uh, through the city and with the city, Mr. Right. Balzoni. Okay. okay. Um, with regard to the sewer authority, same kind of question. Um, have there been any meetings thus far with the uh, sewer authority executive director or board to discuss um, the administration's plan about the future of the sewer authority? If so, who has led those meetings and with whom? If not, who will be responsible for leading those conversations? I've not participated in any meeting yet. Okay. I have specifically not wanted to address those issues just yet until I understand and have a better idea of, uh, and working again with Mr. Balzoni, what the, what the contribution number might be to the pension. And then we'll begin to look at the sewer authority, begin to have conversation with the commissioners, with the other stakeholders involved right. in the sewer authority, and determine what, if any, monetization is achievable. Um, I, am not a, I, am, I am not inclined to recommend a sale of the sewer authority to private. Okay. Uh, we generally don't see that as uh, beneficial. Okay. Uh, but I'm just not far enough into it to give you a more comprehensive answer than that. Okay. All right. I, uh, thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank everybody for being here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I just had one question. Uh, in recent weeks, we've seen the emigration of two large businesses from the downtown and talks of others. Uh, does this affect your recommendations to the city in any significant way? Um, it's obviously on our mind because you can get to a point where you create somewhat of a downward spiral. We just don't think you're near there. We think the city of Scranton is uniquely attractive for many reasons. Um, but we have to be careful to understand that businesses have financial concerns of their own. And they're going to look to do the same things we're looking to do, shave margins, in, shave expenses, and improve their margins. <coughs> so the proposition, the value added for retaining businesses is not so much within my scope of work that I have right now, but I am very cognizant of it as we begin to look at a revenue structure that might relieve pressure and create for more incentive. Uh, and some of that's more likely to be done in partnership with your state legislators through the incentive packages that they're so uniquely equipped to do. But we are cognizant of it. We are certainly aware of it. We're schooled in some of this stuff. So we'll bring that experience to the table, but it's not within my specific assignment uh, presently. Does anyone uh, wish to comment? Uh, Mr. Bolzoni? I, I think with, re with regard to your comment, uh, uh, Bob, I, I think it's the departure of the, the businesses was stark enough to change the complexion of how we approach some of this. A and I think what we have to consider is that that's a fairly significant negative in terms of how we're really viewing the downtown. But I think what you have to recall or what you have to remember as well is that we've also had a significant expansion of the residential aspects of the downtown. And that's a huge positive. So the question is in that evolution is how do you address that positive and enhance it? I, I think it's going to be more the development of some complementary businesses and maybe getting away from the thought process to some extent of the downtown as a repository for all types of commercial businesses. 
there's, a, there's a, a real rethinking that has to take place here. And I think we've started to address that. As, as you're aware, you know, we've, we've engaged uh, some parties to really take a look at enhancing some of the aspects of the downtown. Uh, we've uh, scheduled a meeting with the, the city engineer to look at some, compo some components of the, uh, the street lighting in the downtown and try and deploy some funds that were reserved from a 2002 bond issue to, to address that as well. Uh, it's just with the process, the, the, the evolution of the process, uh, there's always changes that occur and, and those changes really have to be addressed. I mean, the other thing too, and, and you're, you're all certainly aware of this, that these were decisions that were not made overnight. Um, and and as, as you're aware from some of the meetings that we've had, uh, they really were for uh, multiple factors. And unfortunately, uh, it, maybe we didn't have an opportunity to address some of those in time. Uh, certainly, I think we're all more aware of some of those sensitivities now that we've heard them directly. And I think we have to address them going forward. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Amoroso, anything, any follow-up? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the opportunity um, to be here. And uh, thank you to Scranton. This is an exciting engagement for us. And we're happy to work with so many wonderful people. So thank you. And thank you, Mr. Amoroso and Mr. Weiss, for the presentation. And hopefully, as um, things progress and we begin to implement part of this that um, we'd like you to know that you are welcome back um, at any time to, uh, you know, to update us. Um, um, we are looking to work with the administration uh, to resolve some of these issues um, and certainly your input is greatly appreciated. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And finally, I'd like to thank Attorney Shrive, Mayor Courtright, Mr. Bolzoni also for being part of these, this caucus. Um, caucus is adjourned. Call, please. Mr. Wrestler? Here. Mr. Rogan? Here. Mr. Loscombe? Here. Mr. Gaughan? Here. Mr. McGough? Here. Dispense with the reading of the minutes. Third order, 3A minutes of the Scranton Housing Authority's regular meeting held February 3rd, 2014. Are there any comments? If not, receive them filed. 3B controller's report for the month ending January 31, 2014. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. 3C, Lackawanna County Planning Commission Subdivision and Land Development Evaluation received February 12, 2014. Are there any comments? If not, received and filed. <coughs> Clerk's notes, Mrs. Reed? None this evening, Mr. McGough. Uh, any council members have announcements at this time? If I could. I would just like to thank everyone for their, their prayers, their calls, their cards, and their offers of condolences on the passing of my sister, Kathy Martin, last, in this past week. Uh, it's been a bittersweet week because also during that time, uh, we enjoyed the birth of our newest granddaughter, Grace Lynn. And just today, I received the word from my other daughter that she will be having a child in September. So. I must be getting old, that'll be my sixth grandchild. <laughs> but uh, it's been a, a week of, you know, 
a lot of mixture, but uh, thank you everyone for, for praying for us and giving us that strength. Thank you. Anyone else? Um, I would just like to remind everyone that uh, this coming Saturday is the St. Patrick's Day Parade uh, in downtown Scranton. Um, I just, uh, to me, it's a, it's a great day um, for the city of Scranton and uh, surrounding communities. I just ask that everyone um, be responsible. Um, please don't make it uh, a day that people will regret. Uh, it, it's a fun time for families and the parade and um, hopefully um, everyone in the city and the surrounding communities can enjoy it. So again, just be responsible. And that is all. First speaker is Mr. Bill Jackwitz. Good evening, Scranton City Council, Amel, and Ms. Reed. Uh, first of all, I'd like to start off by saying it, it was a long time coming, but we finally got some people in here that, that were able to answer some questions and give us some advice on, uh, on how to get the city out of the situation it's been in for 22 years. Uh, my question to Scranton City Council is, will you be committed to following Mr. Amarillo's solutions and suggestions when he finally makes his final report, or are we just going to continue to play politics? Do you want a response uh, uh, at this time, or? Can you give me a response during motions, please? Sure. I'd appreciate that, and I think citizens throughout the city would probably appreciate that. Uh, on, on going in the same line of, of questioning, or thought, uh, after 12 years and 113 questions, I finally got an answer from Councilman Gone. He, he called me last week and gave me an answer to one of my questions, and I really appreciate that, Councilman Gone. This is the first time in 12 years I actually got an answer to my question. Now, along the same lines again, I submitted 10 questions twice to City Council. I'm hoping that during motions today, some of my 10 questions will be answered. Uh, I've been ensured by the secretaries that the council members have received my questions. So I followed the rules and submitted them in writing, so I hope the city council follows the same rules and answers some of these questions for me. I would greatly appreciate that. Uh, changing subjects a little bit, uh, what some of us citizens uh, have been talking about for years, 10 years, 12 years, myself 12 years, what we were saying was going to happen is actually happening now. And I'm, I'm seeing some change of opinions on some, some people's thinking, and they're actually doing a, maybe a 180 or a 360 because they're actually agreeing with what citizens have been saying for years. Uh, some of us knew that this was going to happen. It was, it, it was no way it could not have happened. The house of, the, the house of cards, the financial house of cards had to crumble. Had to crumble. And it's finally, it's, come, it's coming to fruition now. And, you know, p people in the city are finally starting to wake up and they're finally starting to realize that, you know, some of this could have been prevented. You know, those three to two votes we had for years, they put, us, they put the city of Scranton 50 years behind, in my humble opinion. Uh, at least, those three to two votes killed us. And I think people know what three to two votes I'm talking about. It set us way behind, and we continued to go deeper and deeper into the hole, and nothing was ever being accomplished. I mean, the money went downtown, but look at what's happened downtown. People are leaving downtown. Yeah, people are moving in. They're moving into apartments. Yeah, we're getting students. We're getting medical college students to move in. But the only people making any money off of this are the, are the realtors and the, the landlords and the developers. The city is not making any money because the students are not working in most cases, so they're not paying wage taxes. They're not paying any property taxes because they don't own the property, they're renting. Yeah, they're, they're, they're probably helping the landlord out paying the rent and, and pay, by paying their rent and the landlord paying their property taxes, but again, the city's really not making out. I mean, the taxpayers, the property owners, the ones who do pay the bills and paying the taxes, they're not really getting 
you know, anything out of this. The retailer, or the, not, the uh, developers, they're, they're doing pretty well for themselves. And I'm glad to see the development, don't get me wrong, but we need to do something to bring more tax money and revenue into the city. We've talked about this for years and years and years, and I'm just hoping that someday it will eventually happen and the city will get back on the right track. Again, that's why I ask, will the city, will the city council support the recommendations and the decisions that Mr. Amariso makes when he finally comes out with his final report in I think six months or three more months or however long it's gonna be. Because it's gonna hurt. You're probably gonna to have to hurt hurt a lot of people's feelings. You know, but it's been a long time coming and, and it, it might have to happen. And I just hope that city council supports whatever recommendations that come out and we can finally get the city of Scranton back on, on track. Uh, well, I guess that's about it for tonight. Uh, have a good evening. I would just, I'd just like to answer your one question uh, at this point in time. Um, I, I think all of council is committed to not to blindly follow the recommendations but of Mr. Amoroso, but I think we're all committed to working with the administration and with the consultants to resolve the issues that we have. Um, I, I don't think anyone here um, has indicated any differently. And we look, as I said during the caucus, we look forward to working with the administration to solve the, the mutual problems, the, the problems of the city of Scranton. Um, Next speaker, Mr. Doug Miller. Good evening. individuals to a council who also claim to have a vision for the city. You know, as I stood here this evening and I listened to Mr. Amoroso discuss his findings in a short three-month time he's been here, I couldn't just help but acknowledge the fact that, yet again, there is not one thing that he discussed that we didn't already know. I can recall on multiple occasions our previous finance chair sat right here as he did, and gave similar PowerPoint presentations on the state of this city. And he discussed factual information such as we currently are at an 86% tax collection rate. I think anybody that paid attention would have already been aware of that. And we discussed measures that needed to be taken. So it's no secret that we all should have been aware of that piece of information. We also talked about the biggest gorilla in the closet, and that's nonprofits, pilots. Well, we've been dis discussing that for the last 12 years. Again, not a secret. So, out of all the discussion and, and all the time we've taken to, to gather all this you know, research by Mr. Amoroso, I, I think we have to ask ourselves are, are we really going somewhere, or are we just continuing to just spin around and chase our tail, so to speak? Because we haven't accomplished a single solitary thing. And then I took the time to do some homework on Mr. Amoroso. And I found some things that are somewhat disturbing. And I'm not here to make accusations or you know, accuse individuals of wrongdoing. I can only cite things that are in black and white and hope that we can hopefully if possibly get answers to these questions. But upon doing research, um, I found that Mr. Amoroso was a former hospital CEO of St. Vincent's Hospital, dating back 
to uh, 2006. And according to my research from articles that came from the New York Post, he oversaw excessive spending at this institution, which led to a billion dollars in debt and a bankruptcy. And upon further research, it was discussed through these articles and investigations that were uh, undertaken by the district attorney's office in New York City and lawyers who represented doctors and nurses that worked at this hospital, that this was a grand scheme, a well thought out plan. And Mr. Amoroso was the captain of this ship and he oversaw the fiscal mismanagement of St. Vincent's Hospital. Millions and millions of dollars were squandered on golf outings, luxurious vacations, employees making multi-million dollar salaries. All this done so that the institution can file bankruptcy because obviously they had to have a reason to allow the institution uh, to be shut down uh, because the state obviously wasn't going to allow it. Uh, this was a, an insti a hospital uh, that was overseen by a Catholic charity in New York City. And so after concluding uh, my research, I did reach out to Tom Shanahan, who was a lawyer who did, as I said, represent doctors and nurses, who did sue St. Vincent's Hospital and Mr. Amoroso. And uh, I did place that call, and I am waiting to hear back from him because I do have many questions. And, you know, it's, it's really disturbing to see that Mr. Amoroso, who allegedly, you know, oversaw this and allowed this to happen, that this was something that was, you know, a grand scheme, all planned out, so that this institution can be, you know, closed and sold off to uh, a group of developers who, uh, according to this article here, are the Rubin family, who evidently or allegedly had some sort of tie to Mr. Amoroso and, and those around him, so that they can take this uh, property and uh, develop it to what they sought <coughs> fit their needs at the time. And so tonight when we sit here and we listen to Mr. Amoroso give a presentation on what his alleged vision is for the city, I think we have to question his integrity, his accountability, and most of all his qualifications. And uh, my question, I guess, before I leave the podium would be is, was this council aware of any of this? And did you take the time to do some research on Mr. Amoroso? But I think the most important question we could ask this evening is, did Mr. Courtright take the time to do this investigation because this was his hand-picked individual come and help lead the way for him? So were we aware of this? And that's my question. Thank you, Mr. Miller. I, that you. was a, a question I posed to counsel. Were you aware of any of this information? I, I was not aware of anything that you said concerning Mr. Amoroso. Do you? Thank you. Well, I, I do believe that this council swept under the rug like we seem to let everything get swept under the rug. We face serious financial challenges and we have an obligation to take it serious and if this individual did and definitely do this then I don't understand why we're taking any of his advice. We have an obligation to solve our own problems so maybe it's time we roll up our own Thank you, Mr. Miller. and do our own work. You're welcome. Thank you. Mr. Elman. Council. Good evening. I had my usual four or five people at the grocery store comment to me that after I, I mentioned 40 houses for four million dollars off the payroll, Council had nothing to comment. It, it just bounced off of you people. Keystone has over a hundred pieces of property they're not paying taxes on now. Who's gonna make it up for crying out loud? You know, I don't care what this Pure Charity Act says. These are businesses, they're not, they're not charities or nothing. They are businesses. They don't fit into the Pure Charity Act anymore. The university brags they made 400 million. Keystone got over 100 houses off. Lackawanna College says they're going to grow 
40 percent. The, the medical school wants five acres of land around them. Do you know how many houses are on five acres around there? It just goes on and on and on. And you people aren't doing nothing against the people that are causing this destruction of this city. It's the, all these nonprofits. They're all phony. They're a bunch of greedy parasites that have just sucked the blood out of this city. And I'm, I'm not mad at the council. I'm just saying, it's just my opinion about it. You know what we need? We need about 10 or 20,000 homeowners to come stand in front of this building. Maybe they'd get your attention. Because enough is enough. And you people just don't listen to all these gentlemen and ladies that get up here week after week. It just bounces off of you. Brother McGough, before this year is over, you're going to have to sit there and tell the people of this city there's another substantial tax raise coming. You know it, I know it, and people are expecting it. How do you expect us to pay? Let me tell you something. When I got our house 20 years ago, Mr. DeNaples told me my insurance, my house note, and my taxes will be one week's salary. And I managed that. Now it takes me 20 weeks of my Social Security money to pay the same thing. I'm supposed to be retired. I'm not supposed to have to sell stuff to pay taxes and, and pay for school kids. It, 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 I'm not supposed to have to do that. But that's what's happening in your city. And as far as downtown, that, that, that mall, right there is what kills the mall. Jerk like this kickboxing downtown. You don't think that scares the hell out of women? It's bad enough having to cross uh, the street to go to the mall, and it's, it's a death trap. I don't, it, it scares the hell out of anybody trying to cross Lackawanna. And then you, you're approached by a bunch of druggies that want two dollars, and they want cigarettes, and they want to know if you want a nickel bag. And until that's cleaned up, your ball's going to be a failure. And it's all over the place over there now. It's just gotten out of hand. Yeah, I appreciate y'all letting me get up here and get it off my chest. But it, it's time something's done about the nonprofits. And you people just are fearful to attack them. And somebody's got to do it sooner or later. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Elman. Lee Morgan. Well, Council. Um, good evening. I think, good evening. I think a very troubling thing tonight has come to light by Mr. Douglas here. I think it's the most troubling thing to say about the city government that anybody could ever imagine. And I think that when, when a, I don't know, I think that when a district attorney is doing an investigation of somebody, the government doesn't waste its time investigating people, generally. Okay, so there's, there's more to this than we'll even know at this point. And for this council to not know that, and Mr. Courtright not to know that, it's a very troubling, very, very troubling thing. Very troubling. Now, let me say this. Mr. Amoroso did say one thing today, that Scranton is a very attractive destination, and he's probably right about that, for carpetbaggers and vultures, because they're going to pick every bit of flesh off the residents of this city they can take. I don't see anything funny, Mr. Rogan, but you probably do. Now, my question, because you wouldn't be smiling if you didn't think something was funny, but I, you know, here's what I want to know. How much did we spend to build these parking garages, and what are we going to liquidate them for? How much are we going to ask the taxpayers to lose? Not just Scranton taxpayers, but taxpayers across the Commonwealth who invested in those parking garages, and the residents. And as we sell all the city's assets off, all right, to fund our debt, Look, and I feel bad for the city employees because really when you take a look at what they're trying to do to Act 47 now in Harrisburg, what, what I read in the paper is after five years they're going to let communities file bankruptcy. 
and the, city's, and the state is trying to sell pension bonds because the state's pensions are underwater. And you know, when you talk to people in this city, they're disgusted. I've had a lot of people tell me they just can't pay their taxes this year, they're not going to. We're still tearing buildings down. And the question I have to ask this council and the mayor and the residents of this city is, give it your wildest thought about how much it costs to build a home in the city and see how many we're tearing down. And how many people think that people are gonna come out from outside this city, get a building permit, and spend the amount of money it takes to build a home in this city? And when you talk about them all, well, look at people without disposable income don't spend money, and that's the major problem this mall has. My personal opinion is that Mr. Amoroso's plan isn't a plan at all. It's just another step in the destruction of this city. And that's my opinion. And I think that, Mr. Gauhan, you asked a very serious question in the newspaper, and I didn't have the opportunity to be here. And if I, what I remember is correct in the paper, you asked what the plan was. And I think that all five of you council members need to ask what that plan is. And then you need to ask yourself one more question. Can the residents of this city afford that plan? And take another thing into consideration. What is the average age of residents in this city, and what is their income? When you talk to people on Social Security making $800 or $900 a month, these people are trying to give their home away so they get in the high rise, and it's just a crime. Look, I, like I said, I feel bad for the city's pensions plans and the, and, the, and the city employees. And in the end, I think in the end, statewide and citywide, these people are going to take a beating when it takes time, when the time comes to get their pension. Because you can't take money off of ordinary citizens who aren't earning any money themselves. And then, look at no disrespect to you, Mr. Rogan, but I mean to sit there and smile about it. I just can't understand how you could do that. I mean, I sat here and watched Mr. Morgan, you smile. I, Mr. Hold Morgan, on. I'm no. Hold on. I'm referring to your comment, referring to the people that want to come to this city as leeches what and people? parasites. What you said. Did you remember the Civil War? Read about the Civil War. The civil war. In this no, no, city. no, wait a minute. Mr. Read Morgan, the civil there war. are a lot of good people here in this city, and that's what You're we're here right, for. I'm not talking about the people in this city. I'm talking about all the people that are coming here, buying our debt and sucking the life out of us like the people that took over the parking authority, like the people who formerly took over the Scranton Sewer Authority, like all those vultures, and all the people that we're gonna buy bonds off of, those are the vultures. And they've got willing accomplices here on that council who keep leveraging more debt on the residents of this city who have no money. That's what I'm talking about. And if you took a little time to open a book and read something, you'd know what a carpetbagger was because you go to the Old South and see what happened after the South lost the Civil War and how the Northerners went down there and picked the flesh off them. So please, read a little bit and understand what somebody's saying to you before you try to respond. Okay? And Can the I truth of the matter now? here is this. The residents in this city have no more money. Borrowing more money is not the answer either. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to reply really quick. When anyone comes and refers to people that want to come to this city as carpetbaggers and leeches, that's completely inappropriate for a city council meeting and for a forum. One of the biggest problems with this city is people are leaving our city. We need to invite people to come here and live and move into our neighborhoods. We see neighborhoods all around us in other cities filled with crime and problems, and there are good people in those neighborhoods dying to get out. And they're the people we want to come here and have a family in the city. They're not parasites or leeches, Mr. Morgan. They're the people we want to come to this city to raise a family, to work here, and to pay taxes here. Joan Hodewanitz. Good evening. Joan Hodewanitz, taxpayer. Good evening. Uh, God, I'm going to have to go against the grain here, or else I'm in the twilight zone. But I was very happy to sit in the caucus, and I was very happy that it took place. I was one of the people that asked that you could get Mr. Amoroso in here and brief us on his findings and recommendations. My understanding is this is a preliminary report 
okay, and he's not up to the point of making many recommendations. Now, I don't know anything about his past history. I did not Google him. I did not vet him. Um, but I am interested in the contents of his briefing, and I think that there is a possibility of sitting down and analyzing his, his briefing to us and saying, you know, uh, what's valid in it, and I think there's a lot of good information in there. It was not pitched as an attempt to, this is my plan ahead, this is my way forward. This was his initial findings. I think what the city needs is governmental transparency, and that's why I was happy to see the mayor and his administrative leaders here with him uh, as part of this briefing taking questions from the council. Now, if there's bad information in that briefing, I, I, I think we'll be able to pull it out. I, I don't see the usefulness of simply attacking Mr. Amoroso and <coughs> ignoring his findings out of hand, dismissing them out of hand. I think that's too early to be doing that. I want to see transparency from the municipal leadership and from city council, and I think this is a first step in that direction. If the information presented to us is inaccurate or uh, bogus, well, we'll get to that point and we'll find that out. But this is the first step in reestablishing credibility as far as I'm concerned, and I think it was a good faith effort. Uh, which leads me to my two questions. Number one, is there any possibility that we can request a copy of that briefing from Mr. Amoroso so, so IT can put it on the website? I think that would be good so that, that citizens can pull it up again and give it a relook because there was a lot of information in there. And my second thing is, I think it would be a good idea if maybe at the four month point and the six month point, he can be invited back with the city leadership to say, okay, this is the next piece that I wanna brief you on and th these are my final conclusions at the end of six months and this is what I'm handing off to the city leadership and the city council. I'd be very uh, happy to see that done. But again, I, you know, I, I was happy to be sitting there. This is a breath of fresh air as far as I'm concerned, and I hope that you continue this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Franis. Bay Franis, Scranton. I may be reading some of this tonight because I have a lot of stuff I want to cover. So Good forgive evening. me for reading things. I don't normally like to do that. Uh, I want to make uh, comments about Mr. Amoroso in the paper, even today, saying that the reason the city's in financial shape it is because of default on the S Parking Authority. I don't agree with that at all, and I'm going to try to explain to the people that maybe don't know about this. Mr. Rogan and Mr. Loscombe certainly do, because they spoke out. And today, I looked at the caucus from May 31st, 2012, of that meeting with the Scranton Parking Authority when they came in here, Mr. Scopoletti and Mr. Kelly. Paul Kelly was a lawyer for the city, and he was a lawyer for the parking authority at the same time. He was getting paid by both. So who is he representing? The city or the Scranton Parking Authority? That was a huge conflict of interest, although he was asked by Mr. Rogan, I believe, and he didn't think it was at all. He was very rude. Uh, now, another thing. Boyd Hughes pointed out through that whole caucus, and he spent a long time on that, as you recall, about the budget. Mr. Rogan, you even said it was like a two-page budget. You were given one page of a multi-million dollar authority. You got a two-page budget. So Mr. Hughes went through this, and they didn't expect this because what he found out was unbelievable. They came to this caucus to explain the expenditures and the revenues of the Scranton Parking Authority. But Mr. Attorney Hughes did, which he said, you have here May, uh, January, February, March. You have uh, expenditures of, uh, well, Say you want, you're going to spend $30,000, but in actuality, that month you spend 52000 So he rounded it out, and I'm gonna, I'll round it up for you. He took each month, and he took all the figures. He said, at the end of the year, what you have done in your budget, what you're going to spend is $850,000 more that was in your budget, over of what they had in their budget. And this is the budget they presented to you on that day. So Mr. Hughes said, like the salaries, he said some of the salaries were 40000 and then they were really 62000 But that wasn't in the budget. Nothing was accounted for. 
nothing was accounted for. And then Mr. Scopoletti said, well, the people that usually do our budget and do our finances, they're on vacation. Mrs. Renda and some other man, they were on vacation. Well, how about this? That year, Mrs. Renda, her position was taken out of the budget of council. She, was, she didn't even have a job anymore. She was taken out of the budget. They kept her there and paid her from money that wasn't even allocated for her. And they're wondering why their budget was over what they expected. That's just a small example. That's just one of the examples. And how about all the loans that the Scranton and Parking Authority got without coming in front of council? That's against the law. The city doesn't have to guarantee any loans that don't come in front of council for approval. And they did this knowingly, knowingly, and they did it. Dave Bozzoni did this when he worked for Landmark Bank. And this is the man that Billy Courtright hired for a business administrator, just like Mr. Amoroso, like Doug Miller said. Boy, you should really check into the people in this administration. Now, let me see here. Landmark Bank has a, a lawsuit against the city to get the money back. That's just an example of some of this stuff. So what they figured out, what you council figured out, Mr. Brogan and Mr. Laskam, you also said this authority needed to be disbanded and it needed to be dismantled because of all the mismanagement that was taking place. And if you didn't have a default, this would still be going on today. You would have maybe different people because Mr. Corrett would appoint different people other than Bob Scopoletti. But Scopoletti was there from 2008 and he ran roughshod over everything. So all this money, was, there was no accountability. You didn't know how it was spent. That, that $35 million loan, nobody knows where it went, know how it was spent. So if city council did not default on that loan, this would still be going on today. And the city would be such bad shape. And Mr. Amoroso is insinuating because the city defaulted on that, that we're in such financial, thank God the city, thank God you did default on that. And by the way, it was paid a couple weeks later, and every payment of that, every payment since then, from 2011, 2012, 2013, every payment has been made on time and in full. So where he keeps coming off and saying that this default is causing the city financial distress, that's totally crazy. Because the Scranton Parking Authority ran the city into the ground, and they wouldn't tell anybody how they were spending their money. You saw the budget. Wasn't it a joke, Mr. Rogan? It, it was terrible. Yes. I mean, did you get any answers from them as to how they spent their money? No. And didn't you know, didn't you pick up on Mr. Mr. Hughes saying all the money, $850,000 over budget for one year? And they said they had a deficit at $1.6 million. Actually, they had a deficit of $2.5 million. Just one more question, please. This is not regarding to this. Uh, the city of Scranton, I believe, purchased a pothole machine. Does anybody know where that is, if it's being used? Could somebody check and see? I believe we, owed, we bought a pothole machine to repair potholes. Does somebody know about that? I know we have one. Pardon me? No, that's my committee's the uh, DPW, so I'll look into that. Were, were you I, I'm not sure, but I will look into it. And if they do have one, where is it and when are they going to use it? And if not, why not? Right. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Quinn. Good evening. Good Ozzie evening. Quinn, Scranton. Two months, the citizens of Lackawanna County will be voting on what type of government we're going to have in the future. The Lackawanna County Study Commission had 14 meetings, I think two public hearings, and uh, there hasn't been a debate on the matter so far. So the Scranton and Lackawanna County Taxpayers and Citizens Association Incorporated will hold a debate next Tuesday evening, March 18th at 6.30 p.m. here in Scranton City Council Chambers. It'll be televised by ECTV and those that do not get ECTV, the public are welcome to attend. Representing the county commissioners will be Attorney Joseph O'Brien, former solicitor for the county for many terms under Albridge and Corcoran, former Lackawanna County Democratic uh, Legal Counsel and Secretary. Representing the 
uh, Home Rule, uh, yeah, the Lackawanna County Study Commission will be Attorney Frank Ruggiero. He is the general counsel for the Lackawanna County Study Commission. Uh, we're hoping that uh, we'll be able to have these two uh, gentlemen representing the commissioners and the uh, commission to give their pros and cons on both sides of the aisle so people can look at the what type of government they want to vote on in May. So also I want to tell you about uh, the Hill Neighbors Association will meet on Thursday, March 20th at the Immaculate Conception Church Basement Hall, 800 Taylor Avenue, to discuss blight in households, blight vacant households, blight occupied households, vacant land, crime prevention, crime prevention, taxes, but above all, we want to know what the people want to hear, want us to address. Uh, we want to be proactive up in the Hill section. We want to go back to the days when uh, Eddie Pisano was running the Hill Neighborhood Association. He was, he was one hell of a leader. And we want to try to get the Hill section back and running like it was back in the days of Pisano. We also, want uh, at that at meeting we have invited attorney attorney uh, representative state representative kevin haggerty he's the uh, was the 112 district and he's running again to represent farino and representative uh munley uh representative haggerty is invited because of the fact that he is going to help us with state federal <coughs> and corporate loans we are the only 501c3 in, uh, neighborhood organization throughout the city and we can apply for fed state and corporations uh, through the pennsylvania department of community and economic development programs so we're hoping that also he is also the only uh one who uh so far that i know the other candidates mr bungley has not committed himself on X uh, 76, House Bill 76, which is the elimination of school property taxes. Uh, Mr. Haggett, he has, and we want him to speak about it at the meeting. So uh, anybody is welcome. We're hoping the council will come up. It's next Thursday at uh, 7 p.m., and that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Quinn. Mr. Quinn. Mr. Quinn. Just one moment. Uh, perhaps your April meeting you could reschedule to a night other than, other than Thursday. Um, I know that we like to attend the neighborhood meetings, but being on Thursdays, we already have an obligation here. Uh, so maybe in April you could have your meeting on another night that uh, we could attend and get an update on what you discover at your March 20th sure, meeting. Sure, sure. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Mr. Spraglia. <laughs> Andy Sprague, this is Grant and Fellas Grant County. Good evening. Being as he brought up 76, I wasn't going to. But being he brought it up, you tell me what piece in that legislation says people that do not own property does not have to pay the increase in all the taxes they want to increase. All it is is saying that the property owners don't have to pay, but the renters have to pay because the property is, is going to get the rebate, their taxes they don't have to pay to the school. But the property owners, I mean the people who rent, will still have to pay all the penalties that goes with that deal. I don't count it as a win-win situation. All it is is the have-nots attacking the haves. So that's the way it goes. I listened to the presentation. I didn't find anything wrong with it. You know my son is a college professor who teaches economics and has license in CP. He's also a CPA and everything else that goes with the deal. He's well educated, teaches college in Florida though, so he's really not as too much out here. 
but I listened to it. And what he said was, you should raise taxes every year. That was in his plan. Keep raising taxes and taxes and taxes. I don't see that as really a great solution. But there's a lot of things that could be. Like he said, we could sign contracts with doctors or with hospitals and sometime hope to see if that holds down the medical bills. After all, we wouldn't have that problem, though, if we listened to Mr. Reap, who said we don't have to pay these guys all the way up until they drop dead hospitalization, just cover until they get Social Security. That's what he wanted, but they got him out of that council seat. He was too much for the people. I always bring him up. But the presentation that we saw was similar to the one that Pell put in. If you remember, Pell was here and gave the same kind of deal. And his, their recommendation was the same thing, raise taxes. But you have raised taxes. He finds that the taxes that you raise ain't enough. That means you have to keep raising taxes. And that's really a not great solution. The paper said that we're pretty close to Waverly as oppression goes. All taxes are oppressive. But I tell you, if the paper put in the $300, the $300 we pay for uh, refuse removal and the high cost of the sewer system in this city, we probably would have been above Waverly in oppression to the people. So you got to look at that. You got to look at everything. Like I said before, this city isn't going away overnight. We're going to still be here 100 years from now, even if we're only a few people in it. We'll still be here. But the solution to keep raising taxes is not. I, that's the only thing he did say. Other than in the paper, he said something about the, the business taxes. He thought it would be a great idea to get away from them. And that may come up when he get, gives you the solutions. But before he does that and brings that up, you say dollar amount. If we drop them to taxes and put another tax on payroll, will the dollar amount be the same or greater? You've got to look at everything in dollar amounts. And that's the only way to do it. A dollar here saying this, a dollar, like you said, an offset. How are you going to offset some of them deals in the budget when that was brought up? But he says your budget was wrong anyway. It probably would be. I'm not saying it was right because the fact is all the budget, budgets have been wrong since about 2002 all the way up. They always been under staff when it came to money. We always were in debt. And he brought up a, a year ago, 206. And around 207, that's when Mr. McGough came on council, <coughs> them years. And then he said, there's been out of kilter all the way up. Now, I don't know if you can blame Mr. McGough at all, <laughs> but you do got to remember that he's been there for seven years of this hardship. And three of the other members are already giving you a 100% tax hike. I hope you remember that and keep getting it through your mind. Who raised your taxes? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who wishes to address council? Good evening. Dave Dobson. Good evening. Taxes paid via escrow. Uh, okay. Uh, I listened uh, at home to part of Mr. Amoroso's presentation. I think it's 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. It's rebroadcast. Could you find that out and, and then announce it? Uh, the the uh, council meeting in the uh, the, the caucus, so that I could possibly record it and go over it a little more. I think it's like 10 tomorrow, noontime, Saturday, and so on. Uh, okay, now, from what I've been hearing on the parking garages, I have to say it's a 50-50 proposition. Uh, there's going to be a lot of uh, 
a lot of uh, principal and a lot of interest owed in uh, if we're going to wind up with $200,000 holes, thanks to uh, corporations moving out of Central City, even though a lot of this was probably built for them, taken into consideration, uh, it might be fair to idea to dump them. Uh, and I'd also like to point out that this KOZ was turned down a few years ago. And uh, for instance, it's, it'd be interesting, now Vaxer definitely left because of a, a KOZ offer. And Diverse, I have a question mark because I haven't heard anything or seen anything. But I'd like to point out that a lot of these KOZs, <coughs> when it comes to the rank and file working person, it's not a, it's not a utopia because uh, a lot of times there's uh, very poor public transportation available. In Oliphant, they have KOZs and Jessup. The first question out of their mouth is, do you have transportation? Now, what they offer you to start is $9 an hour. But travel transportation costs a little more than $9 an hour when you consider all the other bills that an average person has to pay. They're trying to keep a roof over their head. In addition, they're running out and buying a $15,000 car for a tin can, <laughs> basically. Uh, so they definitely don't take into consideration any of the woes of the working class. And on the unions, I get the picture that they may be cooperative, but Mr. Courtright has his work cut out for him because I don't think they're going to be interested in backing up too far either. <coughs> and last week I mentioned on the electric bills, uh, and I was also uh, relating it to a sewer plant with privatizing utilities. I was pleased to hear during the uh, speech that, uh, during the caucus, that he wasn't interested in privatizing the sewer plant. And I hope it stays that way. Now on the electric, uh, last week, maybe two weeks ago, my phone rang in the morning. I was still asleep. I picked it up. I found out that it was one of those electric shysters. I hung it up. It continued to ring. I picked it up again. It was the electric shyster. I hung it up again, and I, uh, picked it up again, and it was the electric shyster. And I started screaming, even though it was a robocall. Well, this week, I got a little nasty, and it was a person, and I started using expletives on him. And, uh, um, well, I got a good night's sleep last night. I unplugged the phone. So it wasn't ringing first thing in the morning, and, uh, uh, waking me up. But the point being that these people are trying to sell electricity for four, three and four hundred percent of what you could get out of PPNL and uh, they may even, uh, the state, there's a, a movement to, uh, in the, the legislature, to just assign you to one of these people. So, buyer beware. We don't need to be fleeced any more than we are. And uh, I don't like calling people names with uh, nonprofits, but it is time, and tax exempts, but it is time that we have a fee for DPW and public safety levied on to all tax exempts. And uh, if you check your uh, PA constitution, it does not require me, it, it specifically gives me as a citizen the right to not have to pay somebody else's bill just because they're tax exempt. If they ha need a street maintenance in front of them or DPW services, fire and police, they should be paying something for that. So it's time we just convert that to a fee. I think Andy mentioned it before. And, uh, that, that would be your pilot. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to address council?
Good evening, Council. Marie Schumacher. Uh, Good evening. We'll be a taxpayer on the last possible discount. Uh, this evening, I I'm wondering uh, out on Boscov's strategy for uh, retaining their property on, at Steamtown Mall. Uh, because it is a partnership, they and obviously they can't buy every any share of sale introduction to the the listings. Always says the owner cannot cannot um, bid. So I'm wondering if this would work. The same strategy would work sort of in reverse for a residential property owners who are facing foreclosure. If they could form an LLC, as so many I see in the paper that have the number of the street address with an LLC, and then bid on their own house uh, at, at a sale. Something that some people might want to think of if they're facing foreclosure. I don't know how much it costs to form an LLC, but if Boscovs can do it, I don't know why uh, a private person couldn't do it. Uh, with respect to the agenda items tonight, uh, 3C, uh, I looked at the backup and it noted that the comprehensive was in, uh, in accordance with the comprehensive municipal plan. But how, can somebody give me the date of that municipal comprehensive plan? Um, I used to go to most of the SAPA meetings and DCED rep, I'm quite sure, said that that was a requirement every 10 years, and I, I think ours is probably more like 20 years old. So, are we going to be budgeting for a new comprehensive plan? Uh, something to to put in possibly for 2015, because I think we're probably way out of line. If you could, somebody could tell me next week what the municipal, the date of our current plan is. Uh, and then on 7B, uh, Mr. Laser, will he still be the chair of the tax collection committee as well as this appointment if he's <coughs> approved? Or is he giving up that post or has he given it up? Okay. Uh, and that's a, that's a segue into a, a, a question that's left over from last year that was never answered, which is, Last year, the tax committee collection, uh, the tax collection committee, had a zero budget, zero expenditures. In the current budget, they have three hundred and twenty-eight thousand uh, dollars for expenses. And I would like to know what the difference is that it was zero in 2013, and it's now well over a quarter of a million dollars for this year. So whosoever committee that is, I would appreciate those answers. Um, and I will get them in over the weekend, hopefully. Um, Mr. Amoroso spoke of the health care costs to, uh, tonight. And I wondered, when was the last time, because I'm a real believer in competition and holding costs down, and I haven't seen anything on pharmacy benefits manager. When was that last put out to bid? When was the last time the dental coverage was put out to bid? Um, I, I've got a feeling it's much longer than it, I think it should have been at least. And I would also like to know how much revenue does the recycling program generate and in what form is that? Uh, maybe Mr. Gawain, you can find that out. I know if it's in, uh, if it's a, a straight dollar amount that the city gets, or if they get a truck or whatever, S and H green stamps or something. You're too young to remember those. Um, and this again is a repeat question, many times repeated. How many rental properties have been inspected through the end of February, and when will monthly reports be instituted so that we know how many rental properties are registered and how many have been inspected? Uh, will garbage, trash, still continue to be collected at properties that have not paid the, requ the requisite fee? Last year, 75% of us were pulling the whole load, and I think that's wrong, and I'm still not convinced that this is not a tax. I mean, this is a tax and not really a fee, and I would like to know what the administration's policy is and if you can influence it such that only those people who pay for their trash to be removed 
have it removed? I could answer that. I, I do know that all garbage is picked up. Um, and I agree with you. I think if, just like any other bill, if somebody doesn't pay the bill, you shouldn't receive the service. And, and it's in the, it's actually in the ordinance. Okay, I've got many more sheets, so I'll see you in the coming weeks. And uh, just, Mr. McGough, any, how's the progress on my February 5th questions before I submit more? Um, Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address council? Fifth order, 5A motions. Mr. Wexler. Uh, thank you, Mr. McGough. Uh, after last week's meeting, I wanted to get more information uh, concerning the businesses uh, leaving Scranton. So I, I met with uh, Mayor Courtright and I also had meetings with uh, Bob Durkin of the Chamber of Commerce and uh, Leslie Collins of Scranton Tomorrow. Uh, Mr. Durkin described the efforts that the Chamber and uh, past Mayor Doherty and Mayor Corre made in keeping VACSER and diversified in downtown. Uh, I'm satisfied that this, the uh, efforts were sufficient and the final decisions were made by large corporations who were looking out for their bottom line. Uh, I spoke to Ms. Collins and her group Scranton Tomorrow still continues to do their work uh, even as, as a, a smaller role than they had in the past. Uh, they continue to try to help our downtown. Her group brings together many downtown businesses to discuss uh, influence business retentions. And they also are working on a plan to, for our changing downtown that retains our current companies and attracts new ones. Uh, as we heard today, our, our downtown is changing into more of a uh, an, an additional lease, a neighborhood section. So some of the things that we have to look at as we go forward uh, will be to incorporate a neighborhood setting into downtown. Uh, the days of it being the office central, uh, perhaps th that has passed, I don't know. Uh, perhaps we need smaller offices that can uh, cooperate more with the uh, apartment type settings that we're gonna have downtown. Um, based upon talking to these people, uh, several issues came out that are, are things that we can work on right away to improve our situation downtown. Um, the one thing that I heard was that the parking garages need to be clean and safe. There are concerns that that is not happening right now. Uh, we also need to complete the wireless internet that was started several years ago and I don't believe to this date uh, that the downtown is totally wireless yet. Uh, as Mr. McGough brought up a couple weeks ago, we need to fix the traffic signals downtown. So it makes it easier for people to drive in downtown and also be able to walk the streets. Uh, there also are problems with the downtown street lighting. Uh, some of people aren't comfortable uh, coming into the downtown because it's not lit well. Uh, these are solutions that we can all work together. We need the city, the county, and the state, and private individuals to sit down and decide these together. Um, Mr. Gahan asked a question about who was responsible. Uh, and I, I put a lot of thought into this and I thought about it uh, and I know for myself as, a, as an elected official it's my responsibility to work with everyone to try to make uh, retain businesses and attract to them but it's also the responsibility of the administration and the chamber and Scranton tomorrow and the businesses that are in Scranton right now um, we, we keep saying that we're optimistic and we are um, but we do have to work together to make these changes happen uh, in addition, this week, Mr. Gahan and I attended the North Scranton Neighborhood Association meeting uh, in concerns to the uh, Rockwell Bridge. Uh, Bill will go on to some of the things that he uh, got out of that meeting. Uh, something that did come up was that the neighbors in that area are concerned about response times from the fire department and from ambulance services. I did speak to Chief DeSarno about that, and he is confident that the uh, fire department has a handle on that. Uh, but in order to uh, bring some peace of mind to the residents of North Scranton, uh, he's committed to me that he will attend uh, a meeting of the North Scranton Residents Association. Um, and once again, this is uh, something that Chief DeSarno was very willing to do, and I appreciate him getting back to me so quickly and also uh, making this commitment to the residents of North Scranton. Uh, thank you, Mr. McGough. Mr. Rogan? Thank you. Um, first, I want to answer a couple of questions that were posed to, to council um, from some, some residents. Um, the first one was regarding whether I was, in, in, I don't know if it was posed that each one of us individually or the board, if we're committed to 
Mr. Amoroso's plan, and, and I concur with what Councilman McGough said that obviously we have to give it a lot of thought and consideration, but the plan has to be formalized first before we could give an answer on that, whether it's something that we would support or oppose, or likely there are parts of it that many of us will like, parts of it that we won't, um, but it's definitely, you know, we're, we're definitely looking forward to see exactly what's in that plan. Um, and I am encouraged with some of the things that were mentioned specifically um, regarding trying to increase pilots in a, in a different way. Instead of going to the University of Scranton or Lackawanna College or Marywood and asking for a check for a million dollars to go into the general fund, um, by asking them to give $250,000 over the next four years to buy a new fire truck for the station that closest serves their facility and everyone else around that facility, um, it might be a lot easier for the city to obtain pilots. Um, we could do the same for police cars, for road paving, and really build up the city's infrastructure, which is in dire need of improvement through pilots instead of through um, g the general fund. And by doing that, we, we increase um, the, the quality of living for all citizens in the city and it reduces strain on the general fund because we won't be paying for those items um, out of the general fund like we would be. Um, next, regarding the questions that Mr. Jackowitz posed, I believe the only one that was um, pertained to my committee was about Boscovs, whether they paid the loan. Um, and I, I did report last week that they did not pay um, the, the, the loan that is owed to the city. Um, I know that it was also brought up about the pothole repair machine, and this is something that's been brought up many times over the, the five years I've been on council. And from my investigation a few years ago, what happened with this machine was um, there was material left in it overnight and it froze. And that's how the machine broke. And I believe it's sitting dilapidated down at the sewer authority currently. Um, I could be wrong, but that's what I recall from a, a couple of years ago regarding that pothole machine. And that's why we haven't seen that out in many, many years. Um, so that's those items. And finally, just to, again, to talk a little bit more about one of the comments that was made um, that struck a nerve um, regarding people coming into the city. And I, I think I've said this a lot over the last few years, and there's a lot of great people in the city of Scranton. Scranton doesn't have the population that it once had. Scranton once had over 100,000 people. And when you have 100,000 people paying taxes, each one of those people has to pay a lot less money. When you have 70,000 people paying for the, the same amount of square miles, um, more structures, more garbage, each individual person is paying more. By growing the city and encouraging good, hardworking people to come into our city and have a family here, that's how we grow. And to say that people that coming in are leeches and vultures is completely inappropriate. And it's not the right image that the city wants to propel to prospective residents. Um, compared to many cities in Northeast PA, Scranton has safe, strong neighborhoods. And that needs to be a priority. Um, I, I, don't feel, I don't get nervous walking down my block at night to go for a walk. I wouldn't do that in the middle of wilkes -Barre. And I think many people in Northeast PA feel the same way. And those residents that want a safe community to live in, but like the city atmosphere, the convenience of having parks and having a professional fire department and a good police department that are living in Wilkes-Barre and in cities like Wilkes-Barre, we invite them to come into Scranton and, and have a family here. And when we do that, we're increasing the population and less, more people will have to pay less. Um, that's what I'm getting at, and it really did strike a nerve when, when one resident did say that about people coming in. Um, but all in all, regarding uh, the proposal that was, or the, the preliminary proposal that was um, brought up tonight, like, like was mentioned by, I think, everyone, much of it are things that we already knew. Um, obviously, the pensions are going to be the bigger long-term um, struggle for the city. Obviously, the $22 million court award is, is a short, the biggest short-term struggle, um, but it, it was optimistic what Mr. Amoroso said, that the unions are negotiating with the city on that. Um, and once that's taken care of, then we can move on to, to the pension, which will be a, a big long-term issue, and it's 
not unique to Scranton from the reading that I've done. Um, so I am optimistic. I'm looking forward to Mr. Amoroso's final report, and that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Mr. Lasker? I'm going to take a pass this evening. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, just a few comments. Uh, the first one, um, I did attend a, the North Scranton neighborhood meeting on Monday along with Councilman Wexler, and uh, there was a, uh, the number one concern obviously was the Rockwell Avenue Bridge. Um, so I uh, am committed to updating those residents um, as news comes through, but right now uh, it's tentatively scheduled to be complete in the fall of 2015. Um, there was a, a number of other concerns from residents, um, and I have them recorded here. Um, however, I was not able this past week to get to them uh, due to an illness, um, but I will uh, reach out to our DPW director um, in the next few days and try to get them taken care of. Um, just a comment on Mr. Wexler's comments. <clears throat> um, that the efforts of the chamber and the administration were sufficient uh, to keep those businesses downtown. That very well may be, but I didn't know what those efforts were and I think they should be made public. And I don't think anybody should be satisfied um, that those businesses left the downtown, took 200 jobs, and went up to Montage Mountain. I'm still not satisfied. I never will be satisfied about that. Um, and one of them, diversified, goes into a chamber-owned building. Um, that doesn't satisfy me, and it shouldn't satisfy anybody. And I, maybe I just wanted to see a little bit more outrage in that. Um, and finally, I would just like to wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, I hope everyone has a safe um, and fun Saturday in downtown Scranton. And uh, just to, that we remember, those of us who have Irish heritage, that um, we march in the parade, we march because we're Irish and we're proud because at one time we couldn't march. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple of comments. First, uh, I would like to uh, comment on the caucus that was held prior to the meeting um, with Mr. Amoroso. Uh, Mr. Amoroso was hired through the Chamber of Commerce and through private donations to the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, his, his help to the city is uh, looked upon by many as a very favorable um, component to dealing with our problems. Does it mean that we are not able to handle our problems ourselves? No. It simply means that we recognize that some of the problems that exist within the city, especially the financial problems, are ones that require, I'll say, extraordinary measures. And, and going out and bringing in someone to help with those problems I believe is a great asset. Um, as far as Mr. Amoroso himself, um, it, it seems as though one of the traditions in this chamber is that if we somehow disagree with someone uh, or their position, that the easiest thing to do is to denigrate them personally. And I, I think that that began to happen this evening. Um, Mr. Amoroso is a highly respected uh, individual. Uh, just to give you a, a brief resume, uh, it, Mr. Amoroso, chairman of the Catholic Charities of Newark and honored by the Diocese of Newark for helping thousands of underprivileged people in that area. Um, called by Mayor Booker of Newark, an extraordinary asset to the city when he went as a financial consultant to the city of Newark, <laughs> director of the New York Medical College, CEO of St. Vincent Catholic Medical Centers, um, board of trustees of the Cancer Research and Treatment Incorporated, and an associate professor of legal studies at Seton Hall University. 
I, I think that that resume um, speaks for itself as far as the credentials of a man coming to uh, you know, offer assistance to the city of Scranton. Uh, the presentation that was made tonight, was it a presentation of things that we knew? Yes, uh, in many cases it was. I, I think what Am Mr. Amoroso has done for us, or is in the process of doing for us, is quantifying some of those problems. What, identifying exactly what it is that is the financial situation of the city. What is the situation of the budget and so on so that we can adequately deal with those those problems and I think the presentation tonight started to do that. We saw um, kind of more um, solidly what those numbers were that we're looking at and, and what what financial what needs to be done or what can be done to to deal with some of the financial problems that we have was it a final report no uh, I, I believe that this is going to be an ongoing kind of amorphic type of uh, process that as we identify problems we will deal with them and um, come up with ways to deal with the problems. Also, as was mentioned by Mr. Bolzoni, there are ongoing negotiations with various entities to, to deal with the problems that we have. This is not something that you can say, this is how it's go going to be done and move forward. Uh, we need to negotiate some of these issues and it's going to take a while to to deal with the, the many problems that were um, elicited by uh, Mr. Amoroso and by others. And hopefully to answer the, as I did before, are we going to support the recommendations of Mr. Amoroso? Um, I believe that all of us will look at what is recommended and it's not something that you are going, we're going to have to do as a you know, one blanket vote and say, okay, let's go ahead and support everything. Um, this is going to be a process that as things are presented to us, um, we will deal with them individually. A and some of the recommendations may be things that we feel are beneficial to the city. There may be things that with which we disagree and would rather approach it in a different way. Um, so, we look forward to working with the administration. We look forward to the process of, of dealing with the, the problems that the city has and, and hoping to resolve them through the course of the years that we're here. Um, again, it's not something that's going to take place overnight, but I think we're all dedicated to dealing specific, with those problems and to finding a resolution, whatever that resolution may be. And that's all I have for this evening. Thank you. 5B, for introduction of resolution, appointment of Robert Weber, 2309 Pittston Avenue, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18505, as a member of the Planning Commission for the City of Scranton. Mr. Weber will be replacing John F. Kennedy, who resigned effective February 7, 2014. Mr. Weber's term will expire on December 31, 2015. At this time, I'll entertain a motion that item 5B be introduced into its proper committee. So moved. Second. Uh, I have a question. Uh, it should be noted that Mr. Weber has presented a resume to the, to the council uh, prior to uh, this being introduced. All those in favor of introduction, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Ayes have it and so moved. Sixth order, 6A, no business at this time. Seventh order, 7A, for consideration by the Committee on Community Development for adoption, resolution number 31, 2014, authorizing the mayor and other appropriate city officials to execute and enter into a cooperation agreement <coughs> between the city of Scranton municipality and the United Neighborhood Centers of Northeastern Pennsylvania organization 
in order to file an application for financial assistance with the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania Department of Economic and Community Development, DCED, for Keystone Facade Grant funding for South Scranton Elm Street Project, fiscal year 2013-2014. What is the recommendation for the Chair of uh, Committee on Community Development? As Chairperson for the Committee on Community Development, I recommend final passage of item 7A. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Gaughan? Yes. Mr. McGough? Yes. I hereby declare <laughs> item 7A legally and lawfully adopted. 7B for consideration by the Committee on Rules for Adoption, Resolution Number 32, 2014. Appointment of William Laser, 677 Mary Street, Scranton, Pennsylvania, 18508, as a member of the Board of the Scranton Lackawanna Health and Welfare Authority. Mr. Laser will fill the unexpired term of Walter Ranikowski, who passed away July 30, 2013. Mr. Laser's term will expire on December 31, 2015. As chair for the Committee on Rules, I recommend final passage of item 7B. Second. On the question. Roll call, please. Mr. Wexler? Yes. Mr. Rogan? Yes. Mr. Loscombe? Yes. Mr. Gaughan? Yes. Mr. McGough? Yes. I hereby declare item 7B legally and lawfully adopted. Any other business? Uh, once again, uh, wish everyone a happy St. Patrick's Day, a happy Parade Day, and please celebrate responsibly. Uh, motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Meeting is adjourned.